Okay, it's uh, it's five past the hour. We'll get started uh, today. So I'd like to welcome everybody that are joining that are joining us today for this uh, SBIR workshop. Uh, today's meeting is the third in a series of work SBIR workshops that we put on. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about commercial opportunity. Uh, the past two, uh, the first one that we did was the introduction to SBIR uh, proposals and a brief overview of the process and how to put together an SBIR uh, proposal. And the second one was the technical plans and budgets, which uh, my colleague Roland Garten put on. Uh, we put on these workshops at, at Enterprise Works, which is the University of Illinois' uh, uh, incubator in the research park at the University of Illinois. And we partner with uh, Research Park and with the Technology Entrepreneur Center and the Midwest i node uh, out of the, uh, which is the i program and the i node in, in the Midwest with uh, our colleagues at uh, Michigan and University of Michigan and Purdue University. And it's a resource that we use in the Midwest here to help uh, commercialize technology out of uh, universities and out of the community. And uh, I appreciate, I, I actually hope this is the last one that I'm doing out of my basement uh, guest bedroom. So, but I guess the benefit here is it's, it's provided a, a lot of us to get together that haven't been able to, to do this uh, in the past remotely. So, uh, again, welcome everybody that's come and hopefully you'll find this uh, useful. Uh, another piece of housekeeping is at the end of this, within a few minutes after we're done, there will be an email that will go out which will give you an opportunity to provide uh, feedback to us. And if all goes well, uh, it'll just take you a few minutes to do that, to fill that feedback out, and then you'll get a, a response with the copy of the slide deck. So uh, we just invite you to take a few minutes to fill that out and provide us feedback, and then uh, you'll get a copy of all the slides here today. Uh, Catherine, are we recording this as well? So as a just to let you know that this will be recorded. So. Uh, you should be able to uh, watch it later if, if needs be, but just a reminder that uh, if you say anything and th it'll be recorded. So uh, with that, uh, I'll get started. And let me just tell you as well that uh, if you have any questions, please use the chat feature and Catherine will be monitoring the chat and will let me know if there's any questions. Uh, is what I'll plan to do is I'll plan to talk for probably about 35, 40 minutes and then uh, leave about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes at the end for question and answer. And uh, if anything's pressing, just feel free to jump in and, and interrupt me if there's something you, that's pressing that you'd like to uh, ask about that I'm talking about. So with that is what I'll do is uh, give you a little bit of introduction, uh, background about myself, and then uh, talk about the objectives of SBIRs. Uh, I'll also talk a little bit about the uh, panel review process and that uh, I'm a frequent reviewer for the National Science Foundation's uh, SBIR program. And then I'll talk a little bit about sections of commercialization plan and then some pitfalls that I typically see with SBIRs and then a few thoughts about optics of an SBIR and then uh, talk a little bit more about the panel review uh, discussion. So uh, I'll probably cover all the stuff about panel reviews here at the beginning and I can I can elaborate more on that at my thoughts on that uh, at the end if, if needed. And also I'll, I'll tell you that uh, uh, some of the usually uh, the other so he, here at Enterprise Works we have a lot of SBIR resources that are uh, available for anybody filling out an SBIR or writing an SBIR and uh, a question usually comes up if those are resources are available to people outside of the Illinois and is what I is what I often say is that the resources here at Enterprise Works are available to anybody in the state of Illinois and that if you're from out of state if you're like in indiana indiana or iowa that typically these type of resources that you have available within your state or at a, a local uh, university so encourage you to reach out to those resources okay with that uh, let me introduce myself a little bit so you have a little bit of context if you're not familiar with who i am uh, so i said like i said my name is jed taylor i'm an entrepreneur in residence here at research park and have been doing that for seven years or so uh, also, my, my main job is I'm the executive director of the Technology Entrepreneur Center, which resides in the Granger College of Engineering here on campus. And in addition to that, uh, before that, actually, I was uh, helped launch a company out of Enterprise Works that was called uh, Pattern Insight. 
And Pattern Insight was a, an SBIR funded company and at Pattern Insight, we leveraged all of the resources of the SBIR program uh, from phase one, at the time there was a phase one B, and then we went to the uh, phase two and phase two B process and, and leveraged all of the, the resources there. And that was pre uh, i -Corps program as well. And then uh, through that process, I, I was asked to speak at the SBIR conference and uh, I think a couple of times. And then after that, I went on to uh, write uh, many SBIRs for uh, some other companies that I've been on the board of. And then at Enterprise Works have uh, 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 helped several companies write SBIRs and then been contracted to write many as well. And then uh, since then, I've been a, a frequent reviewer for the NSF SBIR uh, program. Now, which, which brings up a, a question that I'm often asked, is this a, 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 about just SBIRs or, or NSF in particular? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I, I'll say that uh, when we do this SBIR workshop series, we try to make it as general as possible, but uh, I'm not going to hide that this is very NSF uh, specific or centric because we've got a lot of experience with NSF. So I, I would say that a lot of the comments that we'll make, we'll try and make as general as possible to SBIRs uh, in general, but uh, a, a lot of our experience is specifically with NSF. So if there's a question that comes up that I'm not uh, addressed to a specific SBIR program, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to one of my colleagues, perhaps Roland, that's got more experience with others, but uh, uh, we'll try and make it as general as possible. But there are, there are specifics to specific SBIR programs uh, that, that will direct you to the solicitations. So with that, uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the, what an, a typical NSF proposal, uh, and, and also I'll say that this is uh, this is specific to a phase one. But I will say that for a phase two, I think of a phase two as nothing but a phase one uh, plan just blown out into a whole proposal. So with a phase one, when you're putting a phase one uh, proposal together, um, there's a commercial opportunity section. Well, you start up with an elevator pitch that is typically uh, one page maximum. And then you have a commercial opportunity section, which is two to four pages, an innovation section that is one to three pages, the company team section that is one to three pages, and then a technical discussion, an R&D plan that is a, a minimum of five pages, but it should be five to seven pages. And I would say, I, I would say this commercialization uh, opportunity is what I'm gonna focus on today, and it's two to four pages. With a phase two, uh, that commercial opportunity section, what I'll talk about today, you can think of that as a whole 15 page sec, uh, uh, proposal in uh, during a phase two. Uh, so just think about everything I'm talking about, but a phase in a, for a phase one in a phase two is just its whole document in, in and of itself. So that's how they're different. Uh, and, and I'll elaborate on that today. Now, uh, actually is what I'm gonna do is I was, I was just thinking about this as I was talking. Uh, I, I will talk about, I'll save the discussion for the panel review process at the end. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that uh, at the, more, uh, the last uh, 15 minutes. I'll save 10 or 15 minutes to talk about that. I think I, I myself find that it's very useful to understand how the review process works uh, as I'm putting together a proposal. Because I, I, I always think about that they're the people that are gonna review it. And, uh, and I'll discuss what it looks like, who typically sits on a review panel and the logistics of that, because it helps me frame the proposals I'm writing that. So I'll leave that for the last 10 minutes and then you can ask questions about that. Okay, as I'm putting together a proposal, there's a couple of things I think about uh, when I'm writing that. When I'm writing a phase one, I think about a phase one is a feasibility study, okay? So when you're, when you're writing it and you're putting, the, you're putting the sections together, you're asking for funding to prove out a concept, okay? And so it's important to think about that as you're trying to think about what uh, what uh, technical objectives you're putting together, and when you're uh, uh, think, writing the the actual uh, commercialization sections as well. Another high level goal and concept as you're writing it is I like to think about uh, the appearance. I want to give across the appearance that you're ultimately going to be a phase two B company. Okay, so you may be asking, what does that mean, and what does a phase two comp B company actually mean? So when you're thinking about the, the pipeline through the NSF uh, commercialization uh, uh, pipeline, uh, once you get through a phase one, you'll go on to a phase two. And then a phase two B company means that you've actually achieved uh, external funding. So when you're getting a phase two, 
Phase two now is a million dollars, okay? So NSF will give you a million dollars. And then if you get external funding, you can, NSF will match 50% of the external funding up to a million dollars. So if you get a million dollars in either venture capital or sales, you can apply for a 50% match, okay? Which means that you've got external validation, okay? So as I'm writing my proposal, I wanna make it clear that I'm gonna that I'm gonna be able to become a successful phase two B company, right? And so you just want to have that. When I'm writing a proposal, I want to be I want to get it to the point across that I am gonna there's gonna be a high likelihood I'm gonna be able to be a successful phase two B company. Okay, so I want to get that appearance across. Okay, I also want to be give the appearance and feeling that I'm gonna be that this is gonna be a winner company. Okay, one way to do that is that that you've got. Uh, a voice of a customer, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, but these are these are just concepts that you want to have in mind as you're writing. Okay, another thing is gain the trust of the program manager. Okay, the program manager is one of the key people uh, that makes a decision on a proposal, and you want to gain their trust. Uh, let me put this a different way. One of the ways that I feel I have, I've always felt like in the is a, a participating in a lot of the panels is one way to not have the trust of a program manager is that if you're uh, hiding things in a proposal, if you've got gaping holes in your team and you're, you're trying to hide it in the proposal, or that you need a lot of hand-holding in the process, these are ways to not have the trust of a program manager, okay? That's a, a key part. And then another thing is building momentum in your phase one for a phase two uh, proposal, okay? So if you can lay out in your proposal that uh, you're building up for a phase two and you can actually discuss uh, just a brief section in your phase one that you're laying out uh, plans for a phase two uh, and you're building up to that in your phase one that that's another good thing to show as well. So I, I, I realize I haven't spent a lot of time in here but these are just high level uh, things that I'm trying to build up to in my phase one, okay? Just high level objectives. Okay. So here's a couple of other uh, high level things to think about when writing your, uh, your phase one. Uh, write it so a technical person in a different field can understand it, okay? So uh, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later in the uh, uh, section where I talk about the uh, makeup of a, a panel. So when you're, when you're on a review panel, there are people like myself that are gonna be on the, on the review panel, okay? <laughs> Excuse me, so a review panel, We'll, especially at NSF, we'll typically have a, a group of technical people in your field, okay? So uh, every panel that I've ever participated on in your review panel, uh, or it, every review panel that I've participated in NSF will have uh, half of the people be from the field that you're in, and then the other half will be people that are like myself that are technical but may not be in your field. Okay, and they'll be your commercial reviewers. Okay, so a panel's made up of technical reviewers and commercial reviewers. So if you write it so a technical person not from your field can understand it, then you're in good shape. If you write it so it's so technical that someone can't understand it like myself, then you're you're uh, you're in trouble. Okay, so make sure that somebody that's technical that may not be in your field can understand. Okay, two, high risk. Okay. So you've got to think about it like this, that um, is what I've often seen is that you'll think that you're pitching to VCs, venture, which means venture capitalists, and that you'll try to pitch it in a way that there's no risk, that you've eliminated risk. But that's not necessarily what, uh, what uh, SBIRs are for. They will fund high risk ventures, okay? Now, when I, when I presented in the, the uh, first workshop, I give an example here. We had a team here uh, at Enterprise Works a few years ago that were in their SBIR. They, they treated it like they were pitching to venture capitalists and they wanted to show that they had eliminated as much risk as possible. And so they presented two go-to-market opportunities, okay? Showing that if one didn't work out, they could, they could go the other market as well. And they thought that it showed that they had eliminated a lot of the risk. Okay, they submitted their phase one, and they were ultimately rejected. The feedback came back from the panel that they were not risky enough, and that if the feedback was if they would have eliminated one of those go-to-market strategies and focused on one, 
they would have had a better opportunity or better chance to get funded. So it was what they did is they worked on their proposal, resubmitted it the next uh, the next uh, review cycle month later, and they were funded. Okay, so NSF they are looking to fund high risk ventures that other investors that are too early stage for other investors. Okay, all right. Another general approach I've put down here is I always want to think about I Corps. Okay, now if you think about what I Corps is. I Corps is a program that they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars into. Okay? And this is a pre SBIR program. Okay? So, logically, if you think about this, I Corps and the concepts of I Corps are very important to the National Science Foundation. Okay? So, think about what the concepts of I Corps are about. Okay? And if you're on this call and you're not familiar with I Corps, I would strongly encourage you to look into i and focus on and look specifically on what the principles of i are about. And at a high level, the principles of i are understand who your customers are and understand what value you deliver to your customers. Okay? And incorporate that into your proposal. Okay? As a reviewer, I find that the most the best written proposals that I've ever read are the ones that incorporate the customer's voice into the proposal. Okay? So often I'm asked, what's the difference between a successful proposal and one that is not funded? My experience as a reviewer has been the successful proposals are the ones that incorporate the voice of the customer and especially right at the beginning. Okay. So as an example, a very successful proposal, or the ones that are most successful that I've read, are the ones that will, right at the beginning, will start off and say, here's the problem that, we're, that, that we address, okay? And they'll say how risky or how, how painful the problem it is, and then it will introduce quickly the voice of the customer. And they'll have a quote from a customer that identifies the pain point and the two or three problems that they solve or that they have that aren't being addressed by industry. And then the company will quickly come in and, and, and state how they are addressing those problems. Okay. On the other hand, the unsuccessful proposals, and I'll also add maybe seven or eight years ago when I started uh, uh, reviewing for NSF, these were how the proposals typically looked like. You would have a proposal that would come in and they would just start talking about what pro or uh, start talking about the technology that they had and they would go on and say how great this technology was and how big of a pro or how many problems this technology solved okay so it's quite a bit different uh, approach okay so again think about i and the and the principles behind i okay so another general approach don't hide your gaps and as what I mean by this, as an I or a, as an early stage SBIR team, you are going to have gaps in your team. There's no doubt about it. Okay. Typical gaps that I will see is that are going to be gaps in your team. Okay. Often an I or an SBIR team at this stage, they're going to have gaps in their team, right? They're probably not going to have a CEO or some business person. You know, maybe it's somebody that's, uh, you may have a business person. I'm not going to say that every team doesn't but you're probably gonna have gaps in your business team. Okay? You may have a couple of uh, technical uh, teams or uh, gaps on your technical team, but you're gonna have gaps, okay? So the problem is if you have gaps and you don't realize you have gaps, okay? Or you try to hide them. So let me tell you that the SBIR program directors have seen everything and you're not gonna hide anything from them. So I always encourage teams when writing a proposal to identify your gaps and call them out and then show how you're going to address those gaps in the short term and in the long term. Okay? So I, I, I had a program director tell me, he's told me several times, okay? it's gaps aren't a problem. It's when you have gaps and you don't realize you have gaps, but that's the problem. So when I'm writing a proposal is often what I'll do is I'll put a table in there 
with three columns in it. Okay, the first column will list your gap, and then it'll list the short-term mediation plan and then the long-term mediation plan. Okay, so going back to the idea that your team has gaps, often is what you can do to fill those gaps is you can leverage resources in your ecosystem. So, for instance, I mentioned that we use uh, I, I'm part of Enterprise Works, which is our incubator at the University of Illinois. They've got a phenomenal enterprise and or uh, entrepreneur in residence program. We often at Illinois leverage the uh, EIRs at Enterprise Works to fill in gaps in our team. Okay, so that's what I mean by uh, don't hide your gaps. And uh, I think I addressed the team issue that I have there as well. Okay, the next step I'll talk about is the elevator pitch because this is one of the first uh, sections that you have to address in a in a solid proposal. Okay, so the first and obvious thing I say in here is make it compelling. So remember that most of the reviewers are going to review uh, six to seven, up to 10 proposals, depending on what phase, uh, if this is a phase one or phase two. Don't think of this as a typical academic proposal. Okay? You want to make your elevator pitch compelling. Make it so they want to read the rest of the proposal. Okay? The reviewers are human, so is the program director. You want to make it a compelling proposal that they want to read. Okay? So I always think too, if you can come up with a real world problem that you solve, it's best if you can address a real world problem. Okay. So let me give you another example. Okay. So now, granted, this is 10 years ago. It's about almost exactly 10 years ago. But uh, if you remember the deep water horizon, uh, and, and yes, that's what it was. The, the oil spill down in the Gulf. Okay. So I was working with a team maybe six or seven years ago that was developing underwater acoustic modem technology. Okay. So when we wrote that SBIR, we tried to think of what was a real world problem that that underwater acoustic modem technology could help solve. Okay. So it was really good technology, but we needed something that could tie it to. So as we were talking to oil and uh, uh, underwater oil companies, we were looking at, we ran across an article that talked about um, how the, that technology, if there was underwater acoustic modem technology, that uh, the they could have shut off those water the well underneath the uh, under the Gulf much quicker instead of having a, a, a tethered cable down to that uh, uh, that well underneath the uh, Gulf of Mexico, and they could have stopped that uh, fire much earlier. Okay, so when we were writing that proposal. We were able to address that right at the beginning of the uh, of the elevator pitch. Right, so the reviewer could easily see that and relate what's the value of having underwater acoustic modems because right now everything that they use to communicate underwater has a big expensive cable connecting things on the bottom of the water bottom of the ocean to the surface okay so something like that you can tie it to helps your reader to understand what the value is of your technology okay uh, customer you know, if you can address what pain point you're solving for them, uh, you want to address that right at the beginning and use the voice of the customer as well. Okay. I was talked about, I already talked about the value proposition and the innovation as well. So those are the key parts of the uh, elevator pitch. But if you can address the, if you can, you want to have the voice of the customer in it there uh, right at the beginning. And then uh, something that I don't have on the slide here that I'll mention as well. Uh, if you can tie this to one of the letters of support at the back of the proposal, uh, that's key as well. Okay. Because I will mention here as a reviewer, I mentioned this in the first uh, workshop I did, as a reviewer, the first place I will go when I review a proposal is the letters of support. Okay, I'll go to the letters of support, read them before I start back at the beginning. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll uh, talk here about the commercial opportunity now. Okay, uh, I also meant, I already mentioned uh, be compelling why you wanna do that. You wanna make sure that you are clearly defining the problem you are solving okay i can't tell you how often when you're reading a proposal that the problem is not clearly defined i already mentioned using real real world examples okay the, the, it, it's always better if you can tie it to a real world example that has a monetary value and uses specific numbers that you can tie to it i mentioned that about uh, showing data uh if you can do that and clarify and and uh uh, uh, use data to show the value of the problem. It's it's much more concrete to the to the reviewer, and then using the voice of the customer. 
if you can bring in customers that have no tie to you, just independent voices in there and have quotes from them, uh, it makes it much, a much more powerful uh, example of the commercial opportunity. You want to show them why the reviewer and why the NSF should care about your uh, innovation. Okay, okay so uh, this is pretty self-explanatory. Descri describing your commercial approach, uh, discuss discussing your uh, potential economic benefits about your uh, innovation. I, al I also put a point in here, uh, be realistic. Uh, I think that's also really important. You know, don't just make stuff up and throw out numbers out there, billions of dollars. I'll, I've got a slide here in a minute. I'll, I'll share a, a couple of thoughts about the, the your numbers. And then back up your assumptions. Okay? Don't just throw things out there and make things up. You've got to, you want to back things up. But I'll, I've got a slide here I'll share in a, in a few minutes. Um, okay, commercial opportunity. Niche market versus uh, uh, market versus niche. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts about that. So often you'll get, I'll, I'll get questions about, is it bad to go after a niche market or do I want to go after a broader market appeal? Uh, I'll just say, I don't know if there's a, a, a right or wrong answer about that, but I'll, I'll tell you what my opinion is. Uh, I do not believe it's bad to go after a small niche market if you can clearly define how you're going to go after that market and conquer it. Okay. I'll give you an example. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a team here at, at, in, in Champaign that went after, that had a very niche market actually. They make uh, uh, laser gratings for microscopes, okay? And it's not, a, it's not a large market, actually. It's actually quite small. Uh, now, some people may look at it and go, you know, that's, it's a $4 million. I think at the time when I was working with them, it was about $4 million. Very small, actually. And that's, that's $4 million if you capture the entire market, okay? And at the time, that's the only market they were going after. Now, the interesting thing about it was the only other person in this space was Zeiss Microscopy. Okay? Zeiss, huge, multi, multi-billion dollar company. We all know Zeiss, okay? The thing, and, and, and to make it even more niche, if at the time there was something like 54 customers in the world that bought these laser gratings, okay? And the, the specific faculty member here at Illinois knew every one of those 54 customers in the world and all 54 of those customers knew this faculty member. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is Zeiss, Zeiss's machine that made these laser gratings went out of bit or shut down. Their, their, their machine that made these laser gratings broke. Okay. So they were looking for somebody else to make these laser gratings. And this faculty member on campus had a novel way to make these laser gratings. Okay. So believe it or not, he had the ability to corner the entire market on this $4 million market, okay? Because all these customers in the world that needed this were calling him and he knew how to make it. Now, the idea behind this is if you can, if you can uh, get a, a large share of a niche market, you can go after other adjacent markets afterwards. Uh, if you've ever read the book, uh, Crossing the Chasm, that's a, it's a, it's a valid uh, way to go after a different market. Uh, so if you can, Come up with a niche market in a in a, a concrete way to go after it and corner it and and get a good uh, a good market share of that. It's it's a valid way to do it, and so I don't think that I I am completely fine with going after a niche market uh, instead of going after a smaller part of a larger market. Okay, so I think that's completely fine, and they're completely fine with that at NSF uh, for doing that. So you just need to be uh, have data to back it up and a concrete plan, go to market plan to do it. Okay. So that's all I'll say about that. Uh, I want to make sure I, I leave plenty of time at the end here for the other things, but there's nothing wrong with the niche market. You just need to put, I just need, uh, I, I just want to be clear that you've got to have a concrete commercialization plan that's consistent with your industry and uh, uh, have concrete steps for it. Okay. All right. Uh, for sake of time, let me say a couple of other things here. Uh, industry overview. I, I think my thoughts here on industry overview is you want to make sure that you're consistent within your industry and you want to make sure that you understand your industry. Don't be proposed. I would advocate that you don't propose things that are uh, not within your industry uh, standard, right? Don't, don't be proposing something that the reviewers are going to look at and go, they don't quite understand our industry. Okay. Uh, Okay, the other thing in your within your commercial opportunity section, uh, 
you know, you need to talk about what resources are needed to bring your, your, uh, your, uh, your plan to market and be reasonable and have a reasonable timeline as well. I've sat on panels before in the past where uh, somebody's obviously going to need, need a couple of years to bring something to market. And the person says, I'm going to be, I'm going to bring this to market in six months. And the reviewers understand clearly that this person doesn't have anything to, doesn't really understand what it's going to take. So be reasonable there. That's what I mean by that. And uh, uh, just make sure you put some, some careful thought into that. Okay. Let me, let me take a little bit of time to, to talk a, about the innovation section. I won't spend a lot of time here, but uh, we haven't covered that in the previous two workshops. So I'll talk about that. Um, the product and tech technology, uh, make sure you spend time talking about the value proposition and show the customer feedback and value. Uh, it's just, again, highlighting that you want to spend plenty of time incorporating the customer feedback and voice of customer. So two important sections that I need that, that need to be addressed clearly in your proposal is the competition and IP landscape. Okay, so the competition often will include a competition chart that shows your competitors and where you line up with the competitors. I put two bullet points in there about uh, you know having a competition slide, but I also say be realistic and believable. Okay, Often we've seen a couple of different a couple of different things that people do in there. Like sometimes they'll have uh, check marks, like showing what uh, what you provide versus what the customers uh, provide. And there's all different types of things. Sometimes people will have different colored, uh, like a street light, like uh, stop lights, red, yellow, green, and check boxes. Uh, I think those are great and fine. I think a couple of or or they'll just have uh, you know different vari variations of that where they'll say. They'll have words in it and say, here's what we have, here's what the competitors have. What I put, what I say there, be realistic and believable, is don't do some, don't make some of the common mistakes where it says that you have everything and your competitors have nothing, right? I've seen some of those before where, you know, somebody was bringing something to market in the payable space, like they're bringing some, uh, some, uh, uh, a new technology uh, that that was competing against uh, PayPal, and this this person's technology had no customers, but they had every single thing available, and PayPal had nothing. Okay, I saw something that was doing something similar, and they were competing against Epic, which, if you're familiar with Epic, it's the major hospitals and and healthcare clinics use Epic, and this person had uh, was was proposing something to compete against Epic. And the same thing, this, this person's technology had everything. Epic had like one or two checkboxes. So, you know, as a reviewer, you look at that and you think, wow, this is, this is I, I'm not sure I believe this, uh, this is the case because this, this person should have all the customers then. And, you know, it's just, it just, you kind of strain your credibility if you're, if you're doing that, in my opinion. So uh, be, just, be, just be realistic like that. <clears throat> if you're going to go down that route. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, IP landscape. Um, IP landscape is a is an important part of the proposal. Um, I think the the key thing is you need to have something in there and talk about IP. You don't need to solve all your IP problems, but I think the clear thing that you need to have in your IP landscape uh, proposal or section is that you need to have an IP plan. And often it needs to show that you if you're if you're coming out of a university, it needs to show that you have access to your IP from your university and it, that you use the right terminology. I'm, I'm a big proponent of just showing that you, of showing that you are using the right terms. If, if it's not clear that you've talked to your tech transfer office, that's usually a red flag. And, and let, me just, let me just state that I think one of the key sections of your IP uh, section is that you do not raise any red flags, okay? And red flags would be you haven't talked to your tech transfer office, it's not clear that you have access to your IP. Uh, a potential red flag is that you do not have any IP. Uh, and if, if let, let, let's say that perhaps you're open source, that's not necessarily, that's not a showstopper, but uh, if, you're, if you are open source, then just at least address it and talk about how you have a plan. Uh, a typical university startup IP plan would be and, and, and again, this, this is different for every, or can be different for every team, but a typical uh, uh, IP plan out of a university startup would be something along the lines of, you've talked to your tech transfer office, you have access to the IP, 
you've licensed it from the university or in the process of licensing it from the university. And once, once you're up and running as a company, any new IP created by the company belongs to the company. And you've, uh, you've engaged a, a lawyer that'll handle IP, something along those lines, okay? It's something to be that simple, but uh, the main thing is that you have an IP plan. Okay, let me, uh, okay, let me just briefly uh, hit on the rest because I wanna make sure I leave plenty of times for the other section. Team, uh, just make sure you'd have the right team in place and that if you've got any gaps, you address them. And you can address them by using having a good uh, uh, advisory team in place. Okay. Uh, support. Uh, let me just say that for the support letters, I think they're really important. And you can have up to three in a phase one, up to five in a phase two. Use them all. Have a good mix of them. Uh, it's best if you can have uh, every letter of support show some type of commitment. Uh, it's best if they've committed money. If you can't have support for money, uh, it's great if you can have purchase orders or they've committed something and it could be even that they commit to help test. Okay. But you, it's always best if they can commit something. Okay. What not to do. Uh, I think some what not to do's are that the person says, let me, let me give you, let me just give you an example of what not to do. Okay. A uh, what not to do is a letter that says, and I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this. It says, uh, Dear Jed, it was great when you came into my office last week and I met you, and I look forward to following you as you work on your SBIR. Uh, it looks really interesting and I fully support you. Something along those lines. That's a, that's a bad letter of support, but I, I, I guess it's better than nothing, kind of, but I can't tell you how many times I've seen those on, a, on a, uh, an SBIR proposal. Uh, here's another bad letter of support, in my opinion, from a from an investor, where it says, uh, "Dear Jed, uh, uh, I'm an investor, and your proposal looks really interesting, and we support it, and we look forward to to following you as you pro as you uh, uh, proceed in your SBIR, and and look forward to possibly investing in you one day." As a reviewer, I look at that and I think. That's not a very good letter of support because why haven't you invested in it? And that's a that's a boilerplate letter of support. So it's much better if somebody can commit to it and commit even uh, providing uh, testing or you know any type of resources is better than uh, nothing if they can't provide uh, if they haven't bought something or that. So uh, very very important to have good solid letters of support. Okay, uh, just a couple more and then I'll talk about the review panel. Uh, Pitfalls. Don't don't just mention ICOR in your proposal. Like we went through ICOR, and now it's time to get an SBIR. The best thing about ICOR is what you learn in ICOR. It's not participating in ICOR. So just remember that. Uh, lessons not applied. Another problem with uh, another pitfall uh, from ICOR is when you went through ICOR and you didn't. You're not applying the lessons in your uh, in your proposal. So an example would be you went through ICOR, but you're not applying anything you learned from it. Right, so you're not talking about what you learn from the customers, or it's. I, I actually reviewed a proposal one time, and they talked about uh, what the customers wanted, but actually they were doing something different in the proposal, which was terrible. And uh, another thing would be there's no data to back up what you learn from ICOR in the proposal. Okay, that'd be an example. Okay, uh, I just put this in there to show what a typical SBIR Phase One proposal looks like. And you'll see that in the in this when you get the copy of the slides and other pitfalls. I'll just uh, brush through these real quickly. Okay, we went through ICOR. Now give us the money. <laughs> That's a bad uh, bad idea. Okay, uh, I've had several SBIR program directors tell me uh, you don't. That, that's like a really bad example of ICOR, uh, and you don't want your proposal to feel like that. Uh, here's another one. Don't ever say this in your proposal. Uh, when, when in the competition section, don't say there is no competition. There is always competition. Your competition may be apathy, right? The status quo, okay? No mention of customer feedback. We've already mentioned that. That's a bad pitfall, okay? Product is too far along. That can be a problem, okay? If your product is too far along and the, you're already selling products, that could be a potential problem. Okay, no risk. I already addressed that. If you've already sol solved all the risk 
and uh, you're just asking for money. I've had that be a problem as well. No need for NSF money. Okay, here's an example. I was on a review panel one time and the team just talked about how great they were, how they've raised money, which isn't always a problem, but they, they never made the case for NSF money. I was on a review panel, we reviewed the, the team, we were discussing how, uh, you know, whether or not this team should be, where they should be rated. And we just got done and, and everybody was like, you know, they don't need the money. So you got to make a case for why the NSF should fund you. No gaps in the team, right? Uh, so if you don't, if you've got gaps in the team, but you don't, you don't highlight them, and uh, uh, it's just not clear that if you're not, if you're, if you're hiding gaps, that could be a problem. Um, oh, okay. So this one here, I put in no co commercialization plan equals PhD business plan, uh, and uh, it looks like the the. Uh, uh, Commercialization plan was written by an MBA and the, P and the uh, technical plan was written by a PhD. Uh, that's a problem. Okay. All right. So let me go back to this. I, that's all I've got for here. And now let me talk about the review panel process. Okay. So I've regularly participated on these. And is what a typical review panel looks like is you've got commercial reviewers and you've got technical reviewers. Typically, your review panel has six people on it, and three are commercial, three are technical. The technical reviewers are going to be in your field. So let's say I'm sitting on, a, on a, a, an optical review panel, okay? So they're doing optical technologies. They will typically try to get people from that area, and then they'll have three commercial reviewers. The commercial reviewers are typically like me. They can be technology agnostic, industry agnostic. They just have technical background. But they're 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 familiar with the uh, commercial commercialization process. Okay, that takes up your panel. Now I put this picture in the slide deck because that's often what it looks like. They've got a table and the technical reviewers on one side, the uh, commercial reviewers on the other side. Okay. Now the process is in a phase one review panel. The reviewers will typically get somewhere. Everyone I've been on is typically somewhere around ten to twelve proposals. Now at the NSF, a phase one uh, proposal will end up being around 60 pages. Okay. Now you're probably thinking like, why is it 60 pages? Because the, the, the actual proposal is about 15 pages. The answer is yes, 15 pages. But once you have the CVs, the budget, the, uh, ref the uh, bibliography, the, you know, references cited, the, uh, um, facilities, Data, all, data management plan, all those pages, ends up being about 60 pages. Phase two panel are typically four to six proposals. Each one is anywhere from 80 to 150 pages, so about 120 pages. So when it's all said and done, a reviewer ends up with, I'll end up with about 400 to 500 pages that I need to review. Okay, now, I will start reviewing those about two weeks before the, the before the panel, sometimes the week before. That's a lot of pages to review, okay? Now, I will read every one of those pages. Keep in mind, this is why I, I tell you, when you're writing your paper, you want to make sure those proposals are compelling to read. Because no matter how hard you try, it's much easier to read a compelling proposal. Now, so when you review those, you, you make notes on them and then you show up to the panel and you're prepared to review them, okay? Then every time, all, every time I've done this, each proposal gets a certain period of time to be discussed. And every proposal is assigned a technical reviewer, a technical or a, a lead reviewer and, uh, and, and a scribe. And then the lead reviewer leads the panel in a discussion about the proposal. And you take about a half an hour or so to discuss a proposal, sometimes a little bit less. And then everybody discusses it, gives their feedback. Okay. And then after that, every proposal is given a ranking of either fund, fund if possible, or do not fund. Okay. Then you're kind of ranking back and forth. I always think in my mind, that you want to end up, you just don't want to end up in the do not fund bucket. Okay. But even then, they can be funded if they end up in the do not fund. It's just harder for them to be funded. Okay. But you just don't want to end up in the do not fund bucket. It makes it harder to be funded. 
After that, the panel writes the review summary, agrees on them, and then you leave. And as a panel member, you never really know what happens unless you follow up uh, and search the NSF website. Okay, and that's it. That's how the process goes. But I think it's helpful to understand that process as you write the proposal. Okay. All right. So with that, uh, that is all I have for the uh, presentation. I've left ten minutes, and I'm happy to answer questions. You can. Type the questions in the chat or ask them directly. Catherine, do we have any questions? Not yet. You're very thorough, Jim. If there's no questions, I'm happy to end early also. Any questions? How, okay. Question is, how often do I see phase one or phase two proposals with purchase orders? That's a good question. Uh, often, phase one, not very often, okay? Phase two proposals, uh, still I would say it's a rare occasion. I would say, uh, so let me address this and, and, and answer that question a little bit different way. I would say purchase orders are, are rare. When they happen, it's a really, really good sign. So I would say, uh, let me talk a little bit more about the uh, support letters, okay? I would, see, I would think as you're putting together uh, uh, your support letters, think of it in terms of like a continuum. Uh, I think on the top, uh, you've got a purchase order. That is the absolute best thing you can get, okay? Where somebody's uh, right, I would actually invoice is even better, right? Where somebody's actually bought something. Uh, underneath that is a purchase order where somebody's committing to buy something, and then slightly below that, I, I would say is what what is is really solid is if you can get somebody to say, as soon as you build this specific thing, I will buy it. Okay, that is even that is that is really solid as well. Okay, underneath that is somebody saying that. You know what, this is really interesting to me, and I haven't been able to find something that does this. I've been looking for it, and I'm so interested. I'm going to help you test it, okay? And that's really interesting as well. And then down on the bottom is somebody just saying, like, look, this, is, this seems really interesting to me, and I think it's, it solves a problem that I have. And so I think that's, uh, that, that's also interesting as well, okay? So I, I just think all you can do to get somebody to write something and look, honestly, for me as a reviewer, I, I've done SBIRs myself, and I know it is hard to get a large company to write a purchase or, or to write a letter of support with their company letterhead, right? I remember trying to get let uh, get to get a letter of support from Cisco, uh, Cisco Systems on their letterhead, and it was a nightmare, right? So I I understand if you can get a purchase or a, a letter of support from Cis, from a large company on letterhead, that is important, okay? So those are good. It's just the higher on that level uh, up that chain that you can get with some type of commitment, the better, okay? I just always, as, 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 a, as a writer of SBIRs and a reviewer as well, the more commitment you can get, the better off you are, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So a question there, so I, 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 there's a couple of questions, but I'm gonna jump down to the one that's related to purchase orders and I'll get to the other one. Somebody says, if you have a purchase order, doesn't that mean it is not risky? That's a good question. And I would say absolutely it does until, until there's actually money in the bank, there's risk. And, and also, you know, they're just because you, hey, you can have companies, they, they will fund companies that have millions of dollars because there's still risk in the company not being successful. Hey, we, we had a company here that raised $6 million and still got NSF funding uh, from phase two because to be a successful company, it takes a lot of money. And to be a successful large company, it takes a lot of money and it takes venture capital and it takes SBIR funding as well. And, and, these comp and NSF and the other, uh, the other companies realize that. So they're, they're willing to do their part. Uh, so just having a, 
a PO just, it, it means maybe that sale may not be risky, but the company as a whole still may have a lot of risk. Good question. Uh, the other question here says, commercial information can often be considered confidential, both for applicant, applicant's customer. How do you handle confidential information? That's a really good question. Okay, you can handle confidential information by, you can highlight, uh, it, I'm, I'm gonna talk about NSF and I'm gonna assume it's the same for the other SBIRs, but you can, you can address them specifically uh, through the specific SBIR uh, application processes. But uh, when you're writing like an NSF SBIR, you can highlight some of your, you can highlight parts of your SBIR as confidential, okay? And uh, you, you, when, you, when you go to an SBIR review panel, the, the uh, other people, the reviewers have to uh, uh, commit to being, keeping things confidential. But you do highlight parts of your SBIR that you can say are confidential information, okay? Good question. Uh, next one. Even high if market risk is not as high. Yes, the same thing about technical risk. And, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so a good question uh, asking about technical, so somebody has a question with what I meant about being consistent with your, in your industry. Okay, that's a very good question. Let me, let me be a little bit more clear about what I mean by that. Okay, so uh, let me think if I can think of a, a good example. Um, I used to have several good examples about it. So let's say there's a specific business model that companies have, uh, a, particular, uh, a, way, a, a, a particular business model. Uh, let, let's say that you're a, a software as a service, everybody in your industry has a particular a business model, like a software as a service company, and everybody, does that particular business model, software as a service, okay? And you come in and you're proposing that you're not gonna do software as a service, you're gonna do uh, uh, an enterprise service model, okay? Like you're, you're not gonna do software as a service, everybody's gonna pay you a different way, okay? You're not gonna be, you're not gonna be SaaS, you're gonna be enterprise model. And if you propose that, you're gonna look like you don't understand how your, your, your industry works, okay? And you're gonna look different that way, okay? And you're gonna look like you don't understand how that works. And so that's what I mean by be consistent with your industry, okay? Um, so uh, it, I, I, was in, I was in software, when, when I did Pattern Insight, we were, we were doing, uh, uh, we were doing uh, code quality tools, okay? And everybody paid, every, everybody paid um, enterprise software tools, okay? And we, we went in there and we needed to make sure that we fit in that, that way. Okay, so if I would have in there, went in there and said, look, uh, everybody wants, uh, uh, everybody, and at the time everybody was enterprise software. And if I would have went in there at the time and said, no, we don't do enterprise software. We're gonna sell every, uh, every individual user in that company, uh, one specific, every, every, every engineer has to buy this individually. We would have looked crazy, okay? That's what I mean by be consistent with your industry. You don't want to look like you are completely oblivious to uh, industry because you're going to have people, reviewers on the panel that know the industry. That's what I meant. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Okay, if there are no more questions, we will get out the link to the slides and the uh, uh, customer uh, feedback form. We'd love to get your input, and then we'll send out the slides uh, right after that. All right. Thanks, everyone.